you're on dangerous ground when you take the evangelical thing that the bible is inspired and inerrant and infallible because actually nowhere in the bible does it say that those writings are inerrant and infallible and it all inspired it doesn't say that you know where does it say in the book of isaiah that this was inspired by god it doesn't do i believe that isaiah prophesied with the inspiration of the spirit yeah i'm sure i do did he actually write down as a dictation no i don't think he did he actually wrote and expressed what he felt was god was saying to him through the filters of his own understanding so would have isaiah understood about the suffering servant being the messiah coming i don't think so but he wrote it down because god inspired him to write it or talk to him about it so i, I think we don't need another book with more stuff to fall out over or argue over or come up with a doctrine of god about you know a lot of uh preachers talk about well greasy grace is bad they never mm. worry so much about too much law mm. they're always worried about too much grace okay <laughs> but you're teaching on limitless grace not just um grace upon grace but limitless grace but you know as it as it relates to creation and as divine enabling power right uh that that's at work in us and just that uh, realization more and more of his limitless grace uh that is available just wanted to get your current mm. thinking where you're where you're at with that um yeah i mean limitless grace triumphant mercy um, are both an outworking of unconditional love now if god loves us unconditionally which he does then his grace is limitless because everything about unconditional love is based in God's desire to outwork that love for our benefit and for our good to bring us back to the place that he always intended us to be, which is in relationship with him face to face in innocence. Um, and Ephesians 1, 4 talks about that being restored to face to face innocence in love um, and if love was conditional then grace wouldn't be limitless but because love is unconditional grace has to be limitless because god's divine enabling power is to enable us to be restored to the condition that he originally intended for us therefore his grace is what enables us to be restored to that position and it's limitless because of the nature of the things that hinder us coming back to that place so if you if we think about ourselves the way he thinks about us then we would be outworking that reality but we don't we often think about ourselves the way the world has taught us to think about ourselves or the way we feel about ourselves and we think according to the life that we've lived and all the limitations and hindrances and effects that that life has had on us are limitations which stop us fulfilling God's original purpose for us and our, who we really are in our identity. So his grace is limitless to remove every one of those obstacles and hindrances that we have. Now, you know, I was taught to try and renew my mind to try and think differently it never worked because i was trying to think differently by thinking differently and it just didn't work because i was using the same problem to try and fix the problem but he can change and renew my mind by giving me experiences that change how i think because now i have a testimony of a different way of thinking and so he's revealed himself and shown himself to be unconditional love and therefore expressing limitless grace and triumphant mercy in every situation in my life that has changed how I think about him and then changed how I think about myself. You know, so in the fact, I think people get it wrong when they think of grace 
and greasy grace and all of this cheap grace and all of the words that they use negatively to do with grace as if God is in some way making exceptions or or tolerating us in a way um and they i think they just don't understand the nature of grace because they're taking it as the usual evangelical you know grace god's redemption at christ's expense so they're saying oh well if grace covers everything then it must be cheap and that means it excuses any behavior we have so grace is not the covering of our wrong behavior. It's the empowerment not to have that behavior. Therefore, it's limitless because we're limitless in our ability to do everything contradictory to that. In a sense, you know, we're always coming up with ways to contradict God's love and to contradict who we are and who God is. So God basically has made it impossible for us not to be restored back to that face-to-face -face innocent position. That's why grace is all about God's love, not about our deserving of it or our earning it. Or that's why, oh, well, greasy grace. Well, that means God just sort of, you're just saying it doesn't matter what we do because God loves us anyway. Yeah. From God's perspective, it doesn't change what we do, doesn't change God. But what we do affects us and it affects other people. So, of course, God doesn't want us to be doing things that is going to negatively affect us or affect other people. So he empowers us to live according to who we really are rather than to who we think we are. So I think part of the problem is evangelical Christianity has become very law focused and not grace focused therefore they call it as it, cheap grace or greasy grace as if oh well you're just saying it doesn't matter what we do and god will just forgive us anyway so what's the point we might as well just do whatever we like well i just don't get that mindset you know i remember talking to a guy who was very evangelical and i was saying well why why do you not want to do that and he sort of thought for a while and I said, OK, look, let me put it another way. What's keeping you from doing that? Well, I'm afraid that God will find out, <laughs> basically, <laughs> you know, so so you're only not doing it because you think there's a consequence in not doing it. So you really want to do it. But you're not doing it because you think there'll be a consequence. Yeah. Well, don't you think that's not what God wants? He doesn't want you to be doing something because you're afraid of the consequence. He wants you not to do it because you don't want to do it. Well, you won't want to do it when you think about that the way God thinks about it. And a lot of people are not doing stuff because they're afraid of the consequence of being found out. Either by God or anything else. You know, and actually they're legalists because they're operating under a legal system that stops them doing something with the fear of consequences that's not grace at all grace actually empowers us not to make the wrong choices and to do things that are contradictory to love therefore we need to be empowered by grace and i think part of the problem is they think it's well you're just excusing sin and well god can't excuse sin because he's righteous and holy therefore anyone who talks about unconditional love is accused of greasy grace and in reality what those people are thinking grace means is completely different to what it means grace does not ignore what we do grace forgives us for what we do even before we've done it yeah, and therefore it then empowers us when we begin to see what we're doing from God's perspective, not to do that because it may be harmful to us or other people, because that wouldn't be loving. You know, and God loves us in such a way, but he doesn't want us to stay 
in a position where we're damaging and harming ourselves. So he empowers us to have our minds renewed and therefore not think that way and therefore don't act that way anymore. You know, and I, and I just think it's such a legalistic way of looking at life when you're only looking at a law based consequence of not doing it and, and or doing it. And then God, that view of God, well, God's grace is not going to cover your sin. Well, no, he didn't cover our sin. His grace has forgiven us our sin and sin being lost identity. You know, so he's already forgiven us for that state that we were in. And therefore, he wants us to live in a different state of reality. And triumphant mercy is just that mercy overcomes everything we do do with love and forgiveness and grace. So it empowers that triumphant mercy. So whatever we do, which is contradictory, the mercy of God will overcome it in our lives to empower us not to live that way anymore. You know, and I think, you know, they the whole greasy grace sort of evangelical mantra doesn't understand grace at all. You know, they're actually using it in a completely wrong way. Well, that just gives you an excuse to do what you want. No, I think you only do what you want when you really want to do it anyway. And I don't want to do what I want. I surrendered my free will years ago. I don't want free will to choose to do stuff which is op in opposition to God. I just want to do things that align my heart with God, you know, and do the things that would please his heart and, and the expression of his heart. So in that sense, you know, I just think the understanding of grace from an evangelical perspective is can totally been twisted and warped to mean something it never was in the first place. Because they've just used an acronym to describe something which actually isn't it at all. You know, it's almost like, well, God has to sort of forgive us because of what Jesus did. You know, and it's almost like that, well, Jesus came to save us from God. No, he came to save us from ourselves. That's what he came to save us from. The consequence of continuing to live in lost identity. That's what the saving is. It's not saving us from of an eternal future somewhere is, is saving us from ourselves and the consequences of continuing to follow our own independent path with the consequences of what that will do that is what he wants to save us from therefore grace empowers us and that's what it is and you know it was like we're everyone will say we're saved by grace but then they'll add but it's through faith and then they'll think, oh, that faith is something you have to have. But actually, it doesn't. That faith is gifted to us to enable us to believe what is already true. You know? um, and I think that's the key. Grace is based in unconditional love. And there are no conditions on us receiving it. It is already there for us. When we do receive it, we will enter into the joy and benefits of it. And most people aren't living in the joy and benefits of it at all. Because they've not realized that that is there for them. And of course, the evangelical way of thinking is, well, it's not there for you until you do something. You have to repent and renounce this and do all this and ask for forgiveness and you have to do all this then god will respond to what you've done no god has already responded to what we've done he's responded to our independence and came to identify fully with our independence and accepted that place so the wages of consequences of our independence was death separation from god from our perspective not god's we were alienated from God in our own mind, not in his, so that he'll deal with our thinking towards God rather than God's thinking towards us. God's thinking towards us has never changed. It's always been love. But our thinking towards him has been we are separated from him because we're not good enough. Therefore, we have to come up with what, some way to make ourselves acceptable to God again. Hence, all of the law-based, legalistic, works-based religion 
and there is no works there's an acceptance it's not work it's just i realize what you've done for me oh thank you i accept that but that didn't do it my acceptance didn't make it true it was always true i didn't enter into it until i come to realize it is true then i enjoy it and live in it you know so i think that's you know the difference between the way this grace has been presented in this very negative way as if it's an excuse to carry on doing what we want when actually it's the opposite it's the empowerment not to carry on doing what we want but to do what he wants in relationship with him not out of fear duty obligation but out of desire you know because when we know the heart of god and we experience the heart of god it changes the desires of our heart you know which is what is empowered then wow that was that was powerful mike <laughs> i was getting whacked just listening to you you and justin i just i'll tell you it, it's we are taking everything in and my wife and i as we meditate um going into these deeper realms with god we are seeing and experiencing god uh in very deep ways we can't quite make it all out yet um and uh, I, we're just waiting for that ascension part but i love what you're talking about um you talked about yesterday the hidden text is there any more in the six minute video is there any more to that that you perhaps forgot to mention or or want to say because I'm feeling that there's a lot more behind that. Um, what hidden text, as in there's a lot more that God inspired people to write that we don't include in the Bible. Is that is that what you're getting well, at? Well, yes, because a lot of books obviously were not put in there. Jesus talked about them for a reason. Hmm. Now, because we took some of them out, um there is a lot missing in relationship i i think i believe i could be wrong but um is there anything specific that you feel that would have been really important for us to know today other than the text that we do have um personally i don't think any of that is relevant one way or another okay it's it's engaging with the living word of god jesus being the truth that will bring us into the truth because you could have a whole load of extra books which obviously are in the ethiopian bible and in other bibles you know the catholic bible and they basically have the apocrypha and other books in there um and those books are included but it would just create the same problem that we've got now it's people's opinion of what those books mean that our people are trying to follow rather than follow jesus i mean jesus said you search the scriptures because you think within them you'll find eternal life and you don't come to me yeah you know, who actually is the source of eternal life and that's the problem people think the source of eternal life is by understanding the bible when the source of eternal life is the living word of god as a person and therefore i don't think we need a bible in that way and i think if we didn't have one what would we have the same thing they had for the first 385 years before there was a bible they had the holy spirit guiding them and people sharing what god had shared with them in written form as letters and epistles we call them which probably we would have had in every generation because god would have continued to inspire people to write as an expression so other people could get it but the problem is until the last 150 years most people couldn't read so having a bible oh yeah we've had this bible most people couldn't read it so they're still dependent on someone else telling them what it says and interpreting it for them which brings us back to the same problem you're following what someone else is telling you the bible says rather than following jesus who is the living word of god who's living and active and sharper than every two-edged sword as a person he is the truth 
So if we learn to follow him by the spirit, we won't need a fixed book, which was written thousands of years ago, some of it, 2000 years ago, some of the rest of it, and that to a different audience, to a different context, which is what we don't have today. So what we need is the spirit leading us each day. And if God wants to inspire people to write something that can be helpful to us within each generation that we are operating in, then he will. So I believe that there are inspired writings in every age and every generation that can be useful to help us. But as soon as you canonize it and you make it, this is it, then you've stopped anyone writing anything else which is seen to be authoritative or inspired and that's the problem with the evangelical version of their understanding of the bible god stopped inspiring people to write anything once that was completed hence they will take the book of revelation and they'll take the what it says at the end of the book of revelation about adding or taking away from this book and they'll apply that to the whole Bible because it's the last book of the Bible as we've put it together. And they will then say, if you take anything or add anything to this book. Well, that means no one else can write anything which has the same authority as the Bible. Well, those things which were inspired by God and we only can go on what the spirit reveals to us about that. You know, because I don't believe everything that we have in our written, what we call the Bible, is inspired by God. A lot of it was people's opinions. A lot of it was poetry. Some of it may have been inspired or, or a, a reflection of their relationship with God. But you can't say everything was so God inspired the false prophets to falsely prophesy. And that's part of the problem. No, he didn't. So it's recorded in there because they did it. And that's a record of what others heard and said. So I think you're on dangerous ground when you take the evangelical thing that the Bible is inspired and inerrant and infallible. Because actually nowhere in the Bible does it say that those writings are inerrant and infallible and it all inspired. It doesn't say that. You know, where does it say in the book of Isaiah that this was inspired by God? It doesn't. Do I believe that Isaiah prophesied with the inspiration of the spirit? Yeah, I'm sure I do. Did he actually write down as a dictation? No, I don't think he did. He actually wrote and expressed what he felt was God was saying to him through the filters of his own understanding. So would have Isaiah understood about the suffering servant being the Messiah coming? I don't think so. But he wrote it down because God inspired him to write it or talk to him about it. So I, I think we don't need another book with more stuff to fall out over or argue over or come up with a doctrine of God about. Now, do I think that God can speak to people through writings? Yeah. And for most people, if he doesn't speak through the Bible, he isn't going to speak any other way because that's the only way they expect him to speak. So without the Bible, you could say we wouldn't have all the denominations and divisions and problems. But for most people at this point in time, well, they wouldn't know how to hear God's voice. Now, if we didn't have it ever, then people would have been always dependent like they were in the first 300 odd years to follow the leading of the spirit which is what jesus said my sheep will hear my voice and follow me that's what we should have been doing in every generation and there may have been inspired writings to help us follow him in the context of the generation in which we live not in the context of what was written you know to the early church in a period of time which we don't live in so that was a very specific period in history the old covenant was a very specific period in history. You know, do I believe what everyone says in the Old Testament about their understanding of God? Absolutely not. They came up with a system that God never required. Because they required 
to give something to God because they felt guilty and condemned about the way they were living. God didn't require sacrifices and offerings. So where did the system come from? Well, Moses brought the system because they needed something to help keep them on the straight and narrow because they didn't follow the spirit. Because they'd rejected following the spirit to create a mediatorial system where they had a priest that represented them because they were all afraid of God. You know, come up here to the mountain of fire and smoke. No, we're not going. No, we, we can't come into the holy presence of God. We'll all be burnt up. So you go, Moses. Hopefully you won't get burnt up. But if you do, we'll just carry on. You know, I mean, you know, they didn't want to go and risk being burned up. So they sent someone else. Now, fortunately, Moses was able to go and engage with God. But what Mo what God intended Moses to bring was not what he ultimately brought. And because they refused the relationship, well, the early church, day of Pentecost, what happens? Here's tongues of fire again. And the same invitation, come into a relationship with me, come marry me, is given again. And they hear it in their own languages and therefore they respond in their own languages, tongues, and basically say, yes, we will marry you. Which was completely contradicting what they didn't do before now. And they were clothed with tongues of fire, which was symbolically the same thing as coming up into the presence of the fire of God. You can't you can't come to God other than going through fire. Because fire is love. And love transforms, you know, so Adam and Eve could have gone through the fiery sword back to the tree of life and the source, but they followed their own source and found out that it wasn't working for them. So they had to come up with a system that tried to work for them, but only at work their own guilt and separation from God in their own, the alienation of their own mind. You know, it was not ever God's intention. God always wanted relationship. So, yeah, I, I don't believe any of those writings would have probably been any better than the writings we've already got. Because they weren't written mostly for today. But uh, that being said, you know, I mean, I've read the Bible and used the Bible and God has spoken to me through it originally because I, there was no other way that I expected God to speak to me. And eventually God used the Bible to teach me to hear his voice independently of the Bible. So it's been beneficial in my life. Would I give it to a new Christian? No, I would not. I would teach them to hear the voice of God, to which then God could speak that to them and actually maybe inspire them to write. Because I believe every one of us has a book of our life that's a reflection of God's journey that we've taken with him that could be beneficial to others. You know, so when I shared, you know, my vision destiny series for whatever it was, eight years, I believe to me, they were authoritative things that God said to me, which I shared. I would not expect anyone else to take them as authoritative things that God was speaking to them unless the spirit did speak to them through it. I was not saying, hey, these writings are like the Bible because I wouldn't say that and I don't want another Bible. What I'm saying is, here's what God has said to me. If you find this useful, go back to God and see what he says to you. Because it's all about relationship, not following a manual for life. And unfortunately, people have followed a manual for life and they then are basically restricted by following that manual and solar scripture says Bible alone. So if it doesn't say it in the Bible, you can't follow it. Don't believe it. Don't do it. You know, which is only we know taken so far because most of what we do today isn't in the Bible, but everyone lives that way anyway. So for some people, some of those writings, Gospel of Thomas and other books that people are sharing, obviously things that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and other things that were found, you know, contain some writings which i'm sure were inspired and if they're inspired were they inspired for us or were they inspired for the people that read them and that's what we've got to ask because something that was inspired to be written for the people in the first 
40 years after Jesus ascended. And I try and apply that today when the context is totally different. I am not in the same audience that they are listening to the same situation. Therefore, I'm trying to fit all this into my life. And it really sometimes doesn't really make any sense because the context was, hey, judgment is coming on the system. Get ready. Be ready. In Jerusalem, when you're ready, get out when you see these things coming and the signs that are coming. So get ready, run to the hills, which they did. And then you've got, oh, OK, this is coming. OK, well, we don't understand. And the Gentiles obviously didn't understand the context of the whole Testament stuff and all of the prophecies of the Messiah coming and everything like that. So Paul tried to give context to it with the context of this system is coming to an end soon. Your persecution from these people will be over. Well, we don't live that today. So. It's not really relevant. Now, I'm not saying that there's not truth there, you know, and, you know, there's books there which carry tremendous truth. If you allow the spirit to speak to you through them and apply it to today without trying to fit it into the context of then. So do I believe Ephesians 1, 4, that essentially God has already predestined us to a restored face-to-face -face relationship with him absolutely i do i think that's a total universal truth that is true whatever but would i know that even if i didn't read it yeah because god spoke to me about it and he can continue to speak to us about what is true today in our context in the life we live that's much more relevant to the life we live today than trying to understand what was relevant to them 2000 years ago. So although I do believe that there are other inspired writings, would I encourage them to see them as the Bible? No, because I don't want anyone really to see it. Well, we need a Bible that is fixed and rigid and complete. Let's be open to God speaking to us daily and to inspire us or others to write things that could be helpful. And I think that would be a relational way of looking at life rather than following a regime that comes from understanding God through a book. Because what is theology? Would we have theology and systematic theology of God if there was no Bible? No, because there would be nothing to study to try and work out who God was. So we wouldn't we would have a relationship with God who would reveal himself to us through jesus and the spirit that wouldn't need a book and therefore wouldn't have all the divisions that we've got right now we just have people following up oh that's too dangerous you can't trust the spirit you need a book which is what they're saying you can't trust the holy spirit to lead you and guide you you need a book to do that which is subjective and you can't have an argument because what what if you're just interpreting what the spirit says through your own understanding? Well, that's exactly what people are doing about the Bible. So there's no difference. The Bible is just people's subjective experiences written down, which we try and understand, which is very difficult in our present context and in the language it wasn't written in. So much better actually have the spirit speaking to us in the language we understand and seek to follow him. And if we well, you, what if you go off and into error and you do all this stuff? Well, do we trust the spirit of God to lead us? Do we trust God to speak to us so we can follow him? Or do we need a fixed, rigid set of rules to follow, which is no different than going back to the law? It's just a different set of rules, church rules. And depending on which church you're in, there'll be different rules. So I don't think we need any of it personally. Now, do I believe in this generation they're inspired writings? I think right through history, they've been inspired writings. Today, what are those inspired writings? Well, whatever God inspired. And that's up for the person to engage with it and feel the inspiration of the spirit upon it. So you could read Justin's book, Beyond Human, and that could and i believe it was inspired by god therefore that could speak to you in this generation because it's written from very much from this generation's perspective
Yeah. So for me, God has inspired people and will continue to inspire people. And people themselves are living epistles and inspirations to others. So that we are examples that people can find. I follow God. I hope that people would then choose to follow God themselves, not follow me. And that is the danger of following the writings of a person that then you don't you divorce that from following god who inspired it and therefore you can get up into the whole cult of celebrity and everything else of following people and we're not told to follow people we're told to follow jesus yeah and that is the key the spirit of truth will help us follow jesus the truth and we don't need a book for that but obviously we've got we've got one so we've got to do something with it and i used it a lot most of what i use it for today is to say hey this is what i used to think this said and god has basically shown me it doesn't say that at all so i'm not going to follow it in the way i did before because now i realize that that actually gave me a wrong view of god and a wrong view of myself so is god inspiring people today to write yes and some of them are actually translating the Bible in a way that's more understandable to us from a perspective of love. Hence the Passion Translation or the Mirror Bible. You know, I believe those people are inspired by God to present a different view of God through those writings than what has previously been interpreted and translated. So we're getting a more loving version of god but you'll get people who condemn that you know i was talking to someone earlier and they said oh this is this prophet and he's basically saying hey people are going to be translating the bible and it's going to be translated in ways which are making god more loving and we should not be listening to them you know because they're going to lead everyone astray and it's like well how can you lead astray by defining god as a loving god yeah but they think again that is going to be greasy grace and the slippery slope you know and it's just like oh but that is part of the problem they're coming from a very rigid fixed view of god which is not what who god really is yeah so that yeah. is so crazy mike i mean we talk to a lot of kids uh uh, people maybe younger our, our children um uh, and let them know about god's love and, and mercy and grace and you know they're still stuck on 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 the bible old testament new testament yeah i used to think that uh well god killed all those people at the mountain because they were afraid and they were partying and but god didn't kill those people no he didn't. i think about that angel that killed all those people god didn't kill those people so the more we get deconstructed, and I believe the more we understand God's unconditional love, something happens and something is happening today. Hmm. There is a change. There is, there is a switch going on. It's, it's subtle in some areas. In other areas, it's very bold because hmm. people are stepping out and saying, look, guys, God is love. Hmm. And, and we hear all these prophecies about tomb and gloom and um judgment coming and oh my gosh i, I don't buy into all that stuff i said guys you guys have been doing this for years i don't I, deconstruction needs to happen but really i think that it's just loving people through this stuff and say hey yeah think about this mm. now what a loving god would a loving, compassionate God condemn people to hell that doesn't exist? Well, as soon as I get into that level, it's all over. Hmm. But I think we can yeah. reach this generation today by telling these kids, look, guys, just look inside your heart. Talk to God in your heart and let him show you. And that works. That's hmm. that's happening today, I believe. Yeah. I mean, God is God is working to unveil and awaken to people to the truth. And he's awakening people to love. 
And often those people aren't religious people or people who are stuck in Christian churches. You know, they are struggling to accept the message of unconditional love because they've been conditioned into the buts. God is love. Yeah, but he's holy and he's just, you know, and he's a judge. You know, so he might be love, but that love is he's got this two faced God. He's, he's loving, but he's holy. And well, yeah, they're both the same, you know, <laughs> you know, and and I think that's part of the, the problem that people have a view of God, which is completely um, framed by the systems that they have been indoctrinated with. But God is breaking that down. Therefore, more people are leaving church than ever before because they're not finding God there. They're not finding the true nature of God there. So they're saying, well, I'm going to go and look somewhere else. Now, sadly, some people will look and discount God because of their experiences of church. But actually, in reality, people are finding God who's never been to church and they're finding love and they're experiencing love and they're beginning to recognize the true nature of love and who God really is. And I believe that God is awakening people. And I think you know, the Grace Awakening Network, which is expanding and growing and increasing, has so many people who are coming from such widely different backgrounds and angles and stuff, but they're all coming together around this message of God's love and therefore restoration and God's desire to restore us. I think that is a sign of the awakening that's taking place. You know, about four or five years ago, I prophesied about you know, a stream of flowing, a river flowing of, of restoration to which many streams are going to join. And I called four different streams that I saw from my perspective that were moving towards the same river and they're coming. They don't know of each other. They don't even know sort of what the others believe, but they're all moving in the same way. You know, and those four streams were the mystic stream of sonship people who were experiencing God's love and that was awakening him to who God really was. The, the eschatological stream who were realizing that this angry judging God who was going to judge the world. And actually, no, that's already fulfilled. The tribulations happen. All that's taken place. Then you've got the universal stream who believe, you know, that God doesn't constrain people to hell and actually all people will be saved and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Lord willingly, not under compulsion. And, those people are beginning to flow and the other, the energy, healing, love, light, frequency group are also flowing in this. And you find on the Grace Awakening Network, there are all those groups who came in via eschatology, but now have embraced sort of restoration. Some have come in through the mystic and their eschatology has changed, you know, and their view of the future and what happens to people after they die has changed because they've experienced that directly from God. So you're finding that these are all flowing together. So it's really great when you see that all these different people from widely different backgrounds are all on the same channel, promoting the same message of God's unconditional love and grace. Hence, you got John Crowder, who's sort of, you, know, you couldn't get sort of much further along the wild and wacky mystical stream, I guess. Um you know, in terms of slosh fests and all the stuff they used to do with Justin and others years ago. And up the other end, you've got Baxter Kruger, who's come from a very sort of traditional background. And yet they're all presenting the same message. And I think for me, that's the encouragement that God is awakening things today. People are being awakened. People are beginning to discover grace and the finished work of Jesus and inclusion and all of those things. And when they were coming, they were blinkered. So they were only coming on their bit. Their message is, you know, eschatology realized. You know, it's already done, whether you call it preterist or different views of it. That's their message. And they're coming and they're coming. They can't see anything else. Some are coming on the basis of, no, God doesn't constrain people to hell. You know, all people will be saved, you know. Yeah, because they already are saved and they'll just come to know that at some point during their history, you know, they're seeing that. And then the others are seeing the mystical, you know, and they're seeing the experiences of heaven and this amazing stuff. But then once they start to get closer and closer, 
they start to see more people coming into this strange stream and for me that's what happened to me you know the first thing that i got deconstructed about was the holy spirit and that led me into a change in my eschatology sort of in the mid 80s you know and that sort of brought me into a sort of relationship with god that took me deeper into that that opened the door to the mystical and once the mystical was open i went back to the eschatology and actually god said you stop too soon there's more to this and actually when you see that that opened the door to the inclusion because the same things jesus was saying about the end of the old covenant was the same things he was saying about the end and the fire of judgment but it wasn't the end of the world it was the same thing gehenna was the result of people being caught in jerusalem and being thrown into gehenna nothing to do with thrown into the fires of hell at the end of the world so the same bible verses that they were using for one thing i'm so oh this is the same you know this is I, how why did i separate this from well this was eighty seventy, 70 but the same verse is talking about the end of the world because i was conditioned into that so as i encountered god and i experienced god and i experienced god's love that challenged me to think that that my thinking about this can't be true and now with a broader perspective of now i see where these streams are flowing together much easier you know but i didn't see all of the things until i got to a certain point where actually god enabled me to see not just one aspect of it but the others as well and i and, and i'm really blessed that so many different people from so many different backgrounds are beginning to come together and share their part of the jigsaw puzzle to bring people into a fuller picture of the nature and character of god and god's love and 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 all the rest of it you know so definitely you know i i can totally affirm that there is an awakening and more and more people are getting awakened some people are getting disillusioned and hopefully that will lead to an awakening because they're realizing oh, this is not satisfying this is not working so you know and they're not really sort of stop believing in god they just stop believing in the system because the system is failing you know and then as more and more people in that system fail which is you know what goes on and you get people falling and this that and the other and then people get disillusioned because you know well i believe them and where's their discernment if they did this and this all the other and that questions the system now hopefully those people will not question god they'll just question the system that has contained god and they will find god outside of the system in a better way than they found him within it uh, you know so So, Mike, I look forward to you being a presenter at the Immortality Conference coming up, I believe, in November. Yeah. So clearly that's really an outpouring right now of the realization and the restoration of divine health and, 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 the, and everything that Jesus bought and paid for at the cross, which is victory, you know, over disease and illness in the body, which leads to, you know, perfection and divine health and then eventually immortality so just wanted to hear what perhaps maybe you can give us a sneak peek of what your headline would be uh at the immortality conference coming up um well as it's as it's november i really hadn't thought about it much um <laughs> to be honest uh, i mean to me i my part of sharing it will probably be looking at it being based within the unconditional love of god and that being the inspiration for me believing in immortality because i believe god doesn't ever want to lose any connection to us in this physical realm as well as in spiritually in that sense so yeah but i think i will probably look at it from the perspective of this is not just about no end to life but the quality of the life we live now because why would you want to not die if you were living in pain or sickness or disease that would that would not be love 
to carry on living forever in a state of disrepair and you couldn't get out of bed or you could i mean that that's not that's not what god intends god intends for the fullness of health and more than that into recovering and having restored the abilities that god wanted us to have in a multi-dimensional non-linear way so that we're actually seeing the fullness of what actually immortality is is a quality of life that's come out of our origin in god where we were before we came into this realm and to bring us back to that so that, that's probably my angle of it i know now there's a few other people who are sharing on it so i probably won't get to share as much as i would have done if it was just three of us which i don't really mind you know to be honest it's like i'm happy just to, to see the message being shared and it being shared widespread you know i will probably also think about well if if we're going to live forever what does that mean practically because if other people we know don't live forever we're gonna have to get used to grief and sorrow because you know i mean i've got four children and five grandchildren if they don't embrace immortality then they're all gonna die before me no that's not what i want i would want them to embrace the fullness of their life in god as well but if they choose not to I'm going to have to deal with the fact that I'm going to be alive and most of the people that I know aren't now aren't unless they embrace it, which is why obviously I want this message to share. So more and more people will embrace it and less and less people will die. But I got to be practical and say, looking back in history, there aren't many people who are still alive from the perspective of hundreds and hundreds of years or beyond. There are some. But not that many so i've got to be realistic in how i prepare for the future in not dying and be seeking god for how to live in that way now fortunately he said he would carry my griefs and sorrows so i don't have to embrace that alone also he's my provider so financially most people's pension pots is not going to last 500 years might not even exist in 100 years or even 50 years so we can't be reliant on the system of finance operating in the world today so we've got to be able to draw on the source of life which is not just the source of immortal life but the source of abundant life in how we live it on earth which is not you know and i think it's a nice concept but there's so much more to it for us to think about and engage god with so that we're prepared for it you know it's like well i'm not going to die oh great okay well how are you going to live because the conference is actually called life and immortality because if you don't know how to embrace and live abundant life immortality could be a right pain so we need to be able to live in a, the abundance of life that jesus promised us so that immortality is a joy that we will live loved and we will love living and we will live loving in that state of a consciousness of immortality that will enable us to live within it abundantly you know, I don't see your mortality is, well, I'm going to be frozen in some cryogenic chamber. You know what I mean? And it's like, well, that's not immortality. And actually, I'm not looking at immortality as being something that we generate technology to accomplish. Because that technology might wear out. So I'm looking at immortality from what God has called us into back to his original intention where there was no death there was just life but i do think there are some practicalities that we do need to think about and be ready for and not just assume oh everything will be wonderful then if i don't die no it won't be wonderful if you end up being bedridden forever well, that's no good is it so there's a sense where actually no there's life 
and immortality. And that's the key for me. Life and immortality, abundant life and immortality, which will not end, but will also have within it the qualities and abilities that we are designed to have as sons of God to operate within to bring about the restoration of all things and actually then begin to expand God's government and peace right throughout creation and perhaps even then going into being creative ourselves and where that will take us and where that will lead us as mature sons of God or ascended fathers you know and therefore there's way way more to this than just living in the state we're presently in because I don't think honestly most people would like to live totally in the state they're in now forever so i think what is the abundance we can live in now so that that can continue and that we can fulfill who we are in our identity and destiny throughout it all you know without the limitations and restrictions that have been placed on our mortal bodies which are not to be seen as mortal but immortal <laughs> so we've got to change our thinking towards the whole sense of the body that's one aspect i think that needs to change and then seeing us in union spirit soul and body to that is how i want to live in abundant life i don't want to live out of balance and out of harmony i want to live in harmony and balance and wholeness and in the wonder of it you know which for me is why we need to start thinking a bit more broader about the subject so I'll definitely be thinking about it that, you know, in terms of some of the things. And, you know, I'm not saying we've got the answers, but we want to get people thinking about exploring the truth of it and seeking for that in its fullness, not just, oh, well, I'm not going to die, you know, which sounds great, but it's such a limited perspective on what immortal life is. You know, that we need the fullness of it so we can embrace it and choose to live in that, you know, in its abundance. Yeah. Um, which I believe God is revealing and will unveil more and more so people can be ready. You know, right now, if, if people were just to carry on the way they are, people will be living miserable lives forever. You know, well, I don't want to live a miserable life. I want to live a full, abundant, joyful, grace-filled, mercy-filled, you know, full of God's unconditional love, which reflects him. You know, so I do think there's so much more, even around the subject that we probably even haven't even asked all the questions yet about what it means to live in a, in a state of abundance. Um in that way so probably going to open up the discussion for us then for people then to go back to god and say well what does it mean for me would i like to live forever like i am living now and if the answer is no then we need to see some changes in how we're living right now so that the answer can be absolutely yes and it's only going to increase you know so yeah i i'm sort of excited by um the opportunity and um i'm sure you know justin and i will have some fun together and hopefully the other two are coming in by zoom i think um we'll be able to interact and 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 you know see it as a joy filled opportunity of embracing what it really means and certainly encouraging people to expand their thinking around it a lot. Because um, I think, you know, dynamically, most people would struggle to live forever in their present state. So things have to change for that to be something which I think is even um, what people would want. You know, um, but I'm sure the others will have aspects and things to share on that and things which will, I'm sure will be enlightening and encouraging and hopefully challenging to us to be able to embrace 
what it really means you know um because i'm not sure people really understand what it really means therefore there will be some limitations on their understanding or expectations of it that i think need to be addressed so that people can really go into it with their eyes open and and that's not even saying what stops people having that mindset and belief system now you know it's like well all the other things that they've been conditioned into believing and covenants with death and you know accepting that death is a promotion and all those type of mindsets which need to be dealt with and people's association with time and you know there's the there's the sort of the and i'm not sure if we're going to be able to i'm not going to be able to cover all of that but i have covered some of it before so you know it's not that i haven't talked about it um but we once we've done the unconditional love book um which is sort of getting to its point of looking to edit it um we may well do you know a, a smaller thing on immortality perhaps um which you know, may just set the scene you know that's all oh, i'm sure there are others who are going to go into it in greater depth than i will but hopefully if i can encourage people this to bring the topic for discussion and embracing god with it then that's only going to lead us further you know along that path if you enjoy these videos would you please take a moment to like comment and subscribe it really does help thank you very much